Hey everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Shelby, I'm in charge of Betterson's Digital Media. And for those who aren't familiar with Betterson, we are an animal wellness company. We currently make women's skincare products for cuts, hot spots, and various other abrasions, as well as um, maintenance products for eye and ear care. All of our, pro our wound care products are non-toxic, steroid free, and do not contain any antibiotics. We currently came out with a new foaming shampoo that is based on the thickness of your pet's coat type. And today we have our technical services veterinarian, Dr. Mindy, back with us. She has been in veterinary medicine for over 20 years. She received her DVM from Oklahoma State University and now resides in Southeast Kansas with her husband, two children, four dogs, and six horses. And prior to working with Betterson, Dr. Mindy owned and operated the Animal Care Center in Columbus, Kansas. And thank you for joining us today, Dr. Mindy. Hey, it's great to be here. Just got back from the AVMA convention in Indianapolis, and that was really fun and educational. And I would like to say it was cooler than it is here, but it really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> you can always it's just pretty hot. Here with us. Yeah, yeah. I need to go um, somewhere where there's a a nice breeze in an ocean or something because it's <laughs> here in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, also, I just want to remind our audience that if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the interview and we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions um, for this Facebook Live. Um, I thought it would be great if we address like the most common questions that we get as Betterson animal wellness company um, and you can ask any questions that you have about your animal uh, we'll do our best to answer them thoroughly um, and I also want to just let everyone know that uh, this live does not replace a visit to your veterinarian ultimately your veterinarian is going to be able to give you the best advice on your pet so everything we give you is a suggestion um, maybe something you can take into your veterinarian to ask them more um, details about but they're going to know the best um, being able to physically see your pet. So nothing replace your vet's visit. So we can get started. So that actual hands on. What? Well, so part of it's the actual hands on, you know, we don't, yeah. Yeah. you know, we can kind of give a, a general overview and all of some things, but it's, we can't see your pet and see the problem. So mm -hmm. it really requires someone with a little bit of medical expertise to actually be able to look at the problem. For sure. Um, so we get a lot of questions about our products and whether or not they help with that issue. And I know like summertime, there's a lot more ailments that happen. So figured it would be good to just do kind of a well-rounded um, gathering of the questions. So the first question is, can you use the Betterson ear rinse for swimmer's ear in dogs? Well, it's kind of a two-part question, really. Swimmer's ear a lot of times refers to, you know, getting water in the ear. And a lot of times what people want to do with that is to dry it up. You know, we, we're not, our otic rinse is not a drying product, so it's not going to dry the ear up. But uh, in going to a lot of these conventions, I talk to and listen to a lot of the, what I call gurus in the veterinary medicine, they talk about ear problems. And they used to really talk a lot about trying to dry them up, but we've learned that the ear canal actually has a self-cleaning mechanism that helps bring the debris up out of the ear and um, clean it up and get that wax out of there and all. And if we dry them too much, we actually interfere with that cleaning mechanism. So we've kind of gotten away from wanting to dry them so much. So our otic rinse is great for helping to flush the ear. It's great to uh, help re soothe the ear and help relieve irritations and all. So in that aspect, it will help, but it is not a drying product. So. You know, if, if you just want something that's going to help dry it up, it's not going to do that, but it's definitely going to help with the irritation and all. Um, this one, this next question is a big one, um, is how Betterson Hydrogel is different than the liquid? They both have the same active ingredient, which is the hypochlorous acid, so they're pretty much the same in that. The liquid is... For my usage, more of like flushing, cleaning, irrigating wounds, things like that. I use it initially when I've got a wound that I need to clean up because um, it's going to just kind of irrigate it and flush it off or the hydrogel adheres. So you want to use that more for cleaning and all. You don't want to use the hydrogel for cleaning. But once you get the wound clean, 
Then the hydrogel is a great dressing product. It's going to help keep the wound moist, protect it a little bit, and it's going to kind of adhere to it. And uh, really a moisture donating product. So if you've got a drier wound that you want to keep moist, especially in those areas that you can't bandage, like um, if you've got like a ventral abdomen, a lot of times uh, on dogs, even on horses and cattle, some other problems, other sores, things like that, that you can put the gel on. It's going to kind of help protect them when you can't bandage them. So a little bit different areas of use, but you can use the liquid for um, putting on wounds later. If you've got a really wet wound that's uh, got a lot of moisture in the cell, then you might want to stay with the liquid instead of using the hydrogel. So it kind of depends on, on what wounds you're treating and, and wounds can change. You may have a wound that's very wet and very exudative, and then as it heals, it may become drier. So you might want to use the liquid at first and then switch to the hydrogel. Can I use the equine medicated shampoo on my dog? You know, I get that a lot, especially even talking to veterinarians, because the equine medicated is a ketoconazole based, which is an antifungal. And so there are a lot of veterinarians that are using that in the dogs and all when they have a fungal issue on their hair coats. So we use it a lot. You know, we don't have that on the indication list. It is a equine medicated, but it happens quite often. In fact, I've actually used it myself. <laughs> and and there's no issues with it. It's just formulated for horses. Um, can Vetrison medicated shampoo help with mite damage? That one it was a big one. Damage. Yeah, it's not going to, it's not a paras parasiticide, so it's not going to kill the mites. So you would have to use another product for that and actually get rid of the mites. But once you kill the mites, um, the uh, can actually come in and help clean up the irritation, help soothe them and relieve some of the dryness, itching, some of the problems that mites can cause. So it's definitely going to help after you kill the mites, but it will not kill the mites themselves. Um, someone said that their dog keeps wanting to lick the wound and she knows that this is normal for, for dogs to want to do, but will your products harm if he looks after I have um, put the product on? That's one of the things I always loved about Vetrosin when I was in practice because Invariably, I'd send something home, and if it's some type of antibiotic ointment or cream and the animal would get into it, then I'd get a call in the middle of the night, and the animal had gotten in and adjusted the tube, and I had to worry about whether I needed to have them come into the clinic and make them throw up or give them some activated charcoal or how much toxicity there was. And when I started using the Vetrosin and learned how safe it was, if someone called me and said, hey, my dog got into that bottle and you know destroyed the bottle and drank some of the Vetrosin or licked it, I'm like, it, it's perfectly fine. It's not going to hurt them. So it's it's completely safe if licked or ingested, you know, safe around the eyes, nose, and, and all that. So you don't have to worry about any of that. And that's one of the things I really loved about it is it's safety. That's why I like it, too. And it doesn't burn. Even though they make it seem like it, you're hurting them, they're just like, I just don't want this. <laughs> Some of them just like that. They're kind of drama, drama king yes. and queens. I have a drama but queen dog. On myself and are on, on the Purison, which are human product, and don't get any stinging. And I've got some really drama. I have a King Charles Cavalier that is extremely huge drama queen. I mean, you clip her toenails, <laughs> you would think you're cutting her leg off. But <laughs> I use it on her. Getting older, she gets some of those little warts, and sometimes she'll scratch them and make them bleed. And I use the Vetrosin on her, and and she's perfectly fine with it. She doesn't doesn't throw a fit. So I know it's not really stinging, or she would be. The first one to throw a, a tissy. Uh, is the foam care shampoo safe to use on rabbits? I have a Rex rabbit with some hind end issues. So she sometimes gets messy and I need to occasionally spot bathe her. Since she's a Rex, her coat is very dense and very short. So which formulation would be best? So I guess it's kind of a two part question. Yeah, the medicated we've or the shampoo we've seen them use it on you know chickens, poultry, you know rabbits and all that. Um, so it's I've not had any issues using it in any of those species. Um, I would probably, if I was going to look at the coat density, I would go with either the uh, moderate or the thick coats. And you're not really going to make a wrong choice. It's not like if you use one, there's really a big issue with it. But uh, the difference is rinseability. So mm -hmm. if you would use like the one for the fine coats. 
and on a thicker coated animal, whether it's the rabbit or the dog, you probably have to rinse a little longer to get all of the shampoo out. Whereas the, the thick coat one or the moderate is uh, made to rinse a little easier for those thicker coats. A rabbit. I want to see that. I want to see somebody bathing a rabbit. Bathing a rabbit. Yeah, that would, I would think that, well, kind of like bathing a cat maybe, but some cats yeah. actually like it. So if, they, if the rabbit's used to it, it probably would be fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, is Betrison an antifungal? The Betrison spray itself, our active ingredient, hypochlorous acid, um, you know, basically we're uh, promoted as a wound cleansing agent, skin cleaning agent, but studies on just the uh, hypochlorous, the molecule itself, have shown varying activities as far as antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal, those type of usages. So, um, you know, it, the active ingredient does have those properties. Um, my cat has an open wound from removing an abscess on her chin, and I'm wondering if it would be okay to apply so close to the surgical site. We're having problems keeping her from scratching when when eating or driving with, I think they mean like being around without the comb. What? Yeah, I think that's eating or drinking without the comb. Oh, drinking, I was yeah. Out there. I think that I typed it wrong. Drink. I don't think it's out driving. <laughs> There was a cat that was driving at Super that. That's Zoo. That's the video I want to see. <laughs> there, was, there was a cat at Super Zoo, and she was just driving around in her little police car. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You see all things. But, uh, yeah, um, I actually use it a lot on surgical sites. So anything um, from, you know, actual spay and neuter incisions, um, flushing abscesses, all that, it's completely safe to use around those surgical areas. And it actually can help... Um, you know, with using it more frequently will help relieve some of the irritation so they hopefully don't scratch and all at it as much. I find that when I use it on my incision sites for spays and neuters that um, it they don't lick and chew on the incision as much. So I think it actually helps relieve some of that irritation and itching mm -hmm. and I get better feeling from that. So it's, it's perfectly safe for that and I think it would probably help make her more comfortable. Do you have like a recommended amount of um, application that should happen? the product? I tell most of my clients two to three times a day, usually. Um, it, it kind of varies with how, like I said, how bad the wound is, how much extra day there is on the wound, the environment. You know, if they go out and get into the dirt and all, then I'm probably going to have them try to use it a little more frequently to keep it cleaner. But it, it just varies. But you really can't hardly overuse it, which is one of the great things about the safety of our product is that uh, you're not really going to cause any problems with over with using it more frequently. So I, I, rec I recommend using it fairly often. Hmm. Will Betrison Foam Care medicate and shampoo help with mange? Well, like we talked about earlier, it can help with the damage that the mites can cause, the secondary issues. It is not going to kill the mites. So it's not going to help with that. You actually need a miticide, you know, something that is made for that purpose to kill the mites. But then coming in after you kill the mites, and using a medicated shampoo can help really, can certainly help relieve irritation and help heal that skin. How do animals end up getting like contacting mange? We get a lot of mange and mite questions. Yeah, there's really two types of mange. Um, there's one that is the the normal, what we used to see a lot with sarcoptic mange, scabies, if you will. A lot of people call it scabies. That is a highly contagious mange, so it transfers from dog to dog. Out in our area, you will see a lot of coyotes and all that are carrying it, oh. and it, it's really itchy. They scratch a lot with it. They'll have it a lot of times, um, like on their ears, and, and so it, it's a really contagious one, so it spreads from dog to dog. Now, there's another type of mange called demodectic mange, and that is not as contagious, but it is related to the immune system. So a lot of times the mama dog will be carrying some of it and she may not even so show signs, but the puppies will get it from her. And if the puppy has something with its immune systems not working right, or if it comes down with an infection and the immune system is overtaxed, trying to fight the infection, whether it be a fungal infection or a respiratory infection, then sometimes the mites begin to proliferate and cause a problem. And with those, um, I'll see a lot of issues, sometimes the feet, around the face, around the eyes. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of them used to call that red mange because the skin would be really red with it. And it can be a lot harder to clear up than the sarcoptic, but like I said, it's not contagious. I actually had some clients that had some puppies with the sarcoptic mange and they developed lesions from the sarcoptic, the owners mm -hmm. did. So with Demodex, we don't have to worry about that, but it can be a lot more frustrating to get rid of. So it's really important if you have that to actually get a veterinary diagnosis to find out which type of mange you're dealing with. Hmm. I'll never forget when I first started working here and someone asked us about mites and I Googled it and I had never, <laughs> I had never <laughs> seen it before and it freaked me out. <laughs> yeah. The one thing I probably the most is ear mites. I, I see mm -hmm. more ear mites than anything. And, you know, those, of course, just mainly live in the ears and uh, don't really transfer to uh, people. But I see a lot of kittens with it and I see quite a few dogs with it. And the first time I had, when I first opened my clinic and was practicing, and I always thought it was kind of cool to look at them. So I would swab the ears and put them on a scope and you could see mm -hmm. the mites going around. And I showed one of the clients one time and I thought she was going to pass out. She was... She was, the dog had been sleeping in her bed, and she was like, oh, my gosh. I, was, <laughs> I felt kind of bad doing that. I was like, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they're just like, ugh, creepy crawly. <laughs> um, another question is, I have a pygmy goat with pink eye. The local farm and ranch recommended vetricin. How often do we apply it, and how long will it take to clear up? Uh, I don't know if it's like, is the season for pink eye, but um, I've pink noticed it. It's transmitted by flies, so of course spring and summer is when we have a lot of the fly problems, so we, we get more of the pink eye transmitting. Um, and the pink eye, what we recommend is that you do like three sprays twice a day in the eye. Now, that's what, and that's the study that we did with Auburn University, that's how they, they, they used it in their study, was that they did three sprays, one directly, like in the corner of the eye going towards the center, one straight on and another one from the center. And what that was doing was trying to flush stuff out of the eye. And um, that's they did that twice a day, and they had really good results with that. Actually saw a quicker healing and actually helped relieve the pain in those eyes from using it. Um, so that's what we recommend. Now, I will tell you, in, those were dairy calves, so, of course, it's a little easier with them to get them up twice a day. And, of course, this was a study, so it wasn't like we're looking at a lot of out-in-the-farm practices. But... I have several clients that use it and, you know, I try to tell them if you can get one or two good squirts in the eye, preferably twice a day. But if you catch it really early, if you can just get, you know, even once a day, if you can get really good coverage in that eye once a day for four or five days, we see really good results with that too. It, but you have to catch them early. The earlier you can catch them when that eye first starts the water, the better and quicker you're going to see results. Um, I know we're like, talking and going along that long the, the long the lines of eye care um should you be doing eye maintenance like daily weekly how often are you supposed to be even clearing the eye to make sure that there's nothing in there a lot of that depends on the individual animal and on their environment um you know if you're have an animal that's got a lot of hair i'm i'm a big one i used to have shih tzus i still have one that actually a friend of mine has right now but um, Shih Tzus have what they call a chrysanthemum face, so the hair on their face kind of grows out in all directions, and it can actually grow in, you know, and get in their eye, like having an eyelash in your eye all the time. Yeah. And then a lot of dogs that have those wrinkles, like Pekingese and the pugs and all, they'll have trouble getting the hair in their eyes. So that's really important to keep an, a watch on those. Keep that hair trimmed back, or some people will put stuff on them that make that hair lay down so it doesn't get in there. So things like that are really important. You know, and if you see any watering or any redness, you know, get on it right away, flush it out. Um, if you have allergies, some dogs have bad allergies. Mm -hmm. So in allergy season, if your dog's got watery eyes, I recommend using our, our eye wash daily then to help flush anything out of the eye. It'll help make that eye more comfortable and make your pet more comfortable when they're at night to sleep and everything. If you flush everything out that they come in contact with that day. But it's kind of the big thing is just to be very diligent in paying attention to it because, you know, the animals can't really tell us what's going on. So if they've got hair that's starting to grow in, you may notice them starting to wipe it at their eyes, rub it on the carpet or rubbing up against a chair or like some pawing at the face. Yeah. And then you can take a look and see if there's something in that eye or some hair getting in there that's bothered them. Yeah. And those issues. And anytime there's any irritation, 
certainly, you know, use of the eyewash that we make um, will help clean that out. And then if it continues to get worse, then definitely go see your veterinarian. So when the dogs are getting like, I call them eye boogers. Um, <laughs> <is> that, <laughs> I don't know if that's the technical term. That's what but... everybody calls them. <laughs> Um, I don't know if that's like a sign of something or is it just like the natural, the na the dog's body is just naturally getting rid of stuff or is that something that can be taken care of from the eyelash or I don't know. A lot of it is just individuals. Some of them just have moister eyes, more um, tear production and all, and they get those little crusts. Mm -hmm. It's just a little crust. I still recommend you know cleaning those up because they can get sores under those crusts and get really irritated and, and they get what we call epiphora and cause some real problems. So you definitely need to keep those crusts out of there and wash them with the with the eye wash and then kind of cleaning that area. And if you use it routinely and use the eye wash as a maintenance, even if you don't see the crust and use it once a day or sometimes on some animals you can use it just a couple of times a week, and that can really help decrease that crusting. And what we've also seen is with frequent use, it can actually help uh, decrease some of the tear staining. Mm. So that, um, not that tear staining cause a lot of actual medical problems, but especially if you own a white dog, people don't like it very well. So, yeah, so it can my dog's white. make them prettier. So um, you can, <laughs> but you have to use it frequently. You know, it's not going to remove what's already there. It just mm -hmm. maybe cut down on it reoccurring. But um, the eye, you know, having a lot of crusting in the eyes really isn't a normal thing, but it is something that some dogs are more prone to. Yeah, and I didn't know that sores could form underneath that, so that's really good. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that. When you get those off, they have a lot of sores underneath, and they're really red and inflamed, and the dogs can be very painful. Yeah. Huh. So we have a couple questions. Okay. Um, let's start with Becky. Um, she is saying, uh, what makes a dog shake a lot like they're scared? I have a 13-year-old that does it a lot. Yeah, sometimes some dogs are just more of a nervous animal and some of them will shake. If it's kind of a new thing and they haven't been doing it, um, at that age, at 13, you know, I wonder sometimes about any metabolic issues like some kidney problems or anything that might be causing something. Could also be if we're having some eyesight or some hearing problems, that could be causing some issues, causing her more fear and stuff. So I would definitely get those things checked out to make sure that there's not a reason such as that going on that could cause it. Um, otherwise, as they get older, there are some changes that make them a little more, a little more um, nervous as they get older sometimes, and that things just kind of affect them more. So it could just be a behavior. And there are some good medications out there sometimes that can help calm them. I'm not a big one for using the real sedative medicines, but some of them can be more of an herbal or a holistic type thing that might just take the edge off. But uh, first, I would get checked in to make sure the eyesight and the hearing. Mm -hmm. And that there's nothing going on with the liver or kidneys that might be a medical reason for it. Yeah. I said, if it's a new thing, if it's gone on forever, she just may be a nervous Nelly that, that may need, some, uh, you know, something that's a little bit calming for. Her. Uh, Arena is asking, can you use the equine shampoo on goats? Yeah, I think, I don't know if that was one that we had earlier or not, we kind of talked about using it. I've used it on the goats. I have lots of my clients that use it um, and pretty much have used either the, the regular equine or the medicated. So um, they and certainly the grooming shampoo would be no problem to use on there. What's it? Is it just like it rinses out normal? Like it's not super, like would they, should they be using like the density ones versus the equine or... I would probably just use the regular equine, you know, the Greek, the equine, we only have the one formula on the grooming shampoo and it's just the, the routine. Goats don't have a, a, a big change in hair density like, like uh, dogs do. So it could be fine. The great thing about our equine shampoo for the, the horses and, and goats and all is that it's easy to, you don't have to have a bucket and all that stuff because a lot of the shampoos you should dilute before you put on, which I'm not real good at, but you're supposed to do <laughs> so that you don't have a big glob of shampoo in one area. So with this, you just, you know, take them down to the wash rack and hose them down, get them wet and spray it on. You can spray it on the legs because a lot of times on the show animals, especially if you're looking at and they're if they're whiter and have the white legs, their legs get really dirtier than anything else because they're, you know, laying down on things or walking and you can, it's great for spot washing because you can really just spray that foam yeah. right on there. 
and scrub it up and rinse it off. So um, I have uh, my grandkids, um, Peyton and them, they're five and three, and they love to, to bathe their ponies with the equine tooth and just, you know, tie them up. And they, I think they make little designs all over them with it. So <laughs> with the spray on foam, they can spray it and make little designs and stuff and then scrub it up. And it's easy for them to do. There's not a great big, you know, bucket yeah. they got to have and all. Um, next question from Debbie. Hot spots on dogs, what's best treatment? Well, it kind of depends on how severe they are and how much the dog is irritated by them. Um, a lot of hot spots, if you catch them quickly, our hot spot spray works great to help clean them up. And part of the trick for hot spots is getting them cleaned up because it's kind of like a um, bug bite or something can start it. It can start from an infected hair follicle. But like with, if I get a mosquito bite, I scratch like crazy. So what would be just a little irritation from the mosquito bite, I can make into a big, huge sore because I'm scratching yeah. it. And I'll, even, I'll even scratch in my sleep. And that's what dogs do is it itches so they scratch. And the more they scratch, the bigger wound they make. And they can make it into a really huge spot. So the quicker you can get on it and get that spot cleaned up and get them a little bit of relief, the, the better results we'll have. So um, the hot spot spray works great for that. Now, on some of them that get really severe issues and, and great big spots, I like to go in and clip the hair off of them so that I can really get them cleaned up good. And I, I go out, you know, an inch or so past where the spot is and get the hair completely out of the way. A good bathing with like our medicated shampoo to help remove some of that stuff and then put the hot spot spray or even the hydrogel on the, the area that that time on some dogs that are itching really bad they may need an injection to help stop the itching so that they don't keep tearing their skin up and i've had a few that just absolutely won't leave it alone that you have to give them that shot to help them stop the itching so that they can start to heal but the biggest thing is getting that area cleaned up and getting all that extra day off of it and i find getting the hair out of the way helps a lot how can you usually because I know I didn't know what hot spots were um, mm -hmm. until I had gone to the vet. Or even like starting here, I didn't hear that term all that much. So how can you tell that um, what your dog's biting at is going to develop into more of a hot spot? Well, really, a hot spot just denotes any area that they're constantly messing with. So mm -hmm. it can be most, a lot of times it's on the feet. I have a lot of bulldogs that get them on their chin because mm -hmm. they have all those wrinkles and yeah. they get that moisture under there so a hot spot really just means any area that the dog is constantly licking or chewing at or scratching at and it develops into a warm moist dermatitis that's kind of the actual technical term is moist dermatitis and we call them hot spots because they feel warmer and the dogs continually mess with them so it's kind mm -hmm. of like you know that's a hot spot for them is that they so like I said, anything that they're messing with a lot can develop into a hot spot because they can just keep tearing up their skin and causing more irritation. So it's kind of developed into a vicious cycle. You know, the, it itches, so they start scratching and all at it. The more they scratch, though, so they cause more irritation and that causes more itching. So it just kind of has this vicious cycle they get into and you have to do something to break that cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, wow. <laughs> Every year, every year it happens. Like, yeah. Where did this come from? It just happens. That they'll get to scratch in like a spot behind their ear. They just scratch in, and we'll mm -hmm. take um, like duct tape or anything. Sometimes put a sock on and duct tape it to their foot so that they can't get their nails. Mm -hmm. on that. We can't get them to, to quit scratching at it because you've got to get them to leave it alone long enough. It can yeah. start to heal. So yeah. there's lots of tricks, you know, the, the, the dreaded comb that we put on them so that they can't get the things on their face and all. And, you know, we do lots of things like that because I, I keep telling them not to scratch at it and they just won't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think they listen to us at all. No, if the dogs and if the animals would just listen to me more, they'd heal a lot faster. But I haven't, I'm not like Dr. Doolittle. I haven't been able to get that rapport with them yet. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Doolittle. You know, um, <laughs> that might be out of you. I don't know if you, that might, uh, that, that should be around your time. You should remember Dr. Doolittle. I've seen both versions. I've and, seen the okay. old one, and then I saw the new one with um, Eddie Murphy. Because my dad, of course, start is like, it's, a, better it's better. a remake. Yeah, I like the older one, but <laughs> it's me. But um, 
If I start talking about Mr. Ed or any of that, that's probably a, a little early for you. <laughs> I know who Mr. Ed is. <laughs> um, we have a question from Sarah who says, do some dogs just have more sensitive skin than others? I take my dogs hiking a lot and one always gets really itchy after swimming and exploring while the other is fine after the same activities. Any tips to help him help her feel better? Yeah, definitely they can have more sensitive skin. A lot of times dogs that have lighter hair color, sometimes they have a little lighter skin. They can have more sensitivity. Um, definitely to help her anytime that she does some of those activities, like she's outside, I would, um, if you can, bathe her right afterwards because uh, probably there's something out in the environment that she's coming in contact with or something that is causing her irritation whether it can be, you know, something in water she's swimming, even some dogs, you know, the, if they're in a pool with the chlorine or even out in the salt water can be irritating. So anytime you do something like that, like hiking and taking her swimming, as soon as you get back, I would give her a good bath and the medicated shampoo would probably be very good for that because it has the salicylic acid. It's going to be a little bit soothing to that skin. And uh, so I would, Definitely start trying to do that and see if that will cut down on some of her irritations. Just give her a bath as quick mm -hmm. as you can. And then if she has any spots that are starting to uh, irritate or she starts to lick and chew at or scratch at, then I would get like the hot spot spray or our wound and skin care and put that on there and see if that will help slow it down and get her more comfort. Just like they incorporate it really well into their maintenance program of their dogs. Of like, oh, it knows. Like when they come back home, I'm going to, I'm going to spray your paws um, because I know a lot of dogs have like grass allergies. So like quickly spraying the paws with the with Vetrisin helps a lot too. So you just kind of have to incorporate it into like when you're bring your your baby from outside from playing and they have like all their dirty clothes on to <laughs> yeah. creating a routine yeah, for them. And that's one thing great about our shampoo, too, if, if you've got one that tends to, and I had some that they'd go outside and the grass really irritated their feet, so they would start licking. And so you can actually take the foam care shampoo and just spot wash those feet when they come in. Mm -hmm. You know, just, yeah. just wet their feet and rinse them and rinse it off and then spray the vetrisin on. And that'll help your vetrisin even work better is to give them a little bit of a bath beforehand and get some of that stuff off of there. But um, And that's just like the eye care and the ear care if you've got one that tends to when they come in from outside, they have a lot of watery eyes or they're messing with their ears more. That would be the time for you to use our eye wash or ear rinse is after they've been outside to help get any of those pollutants and irritations off there. If there was anything pollen or anything that might be irritating them and rinse them out then. So, you know, you just kind of know your animal. It's just kind of like, yeah. a, you know, know which one. Some dogs can go outside and, you know, run through the dirt and the fields and everything and never have an issue and others of them get you know within 100 yards of it and they start itching right away so mm -hmm. it's, yeah it's just you gotta know your know your pet um hazel asks i try to bathe my dogs at least once a week sometimes twice if they get super dirty during the week is that too much i don't want to get their skin too dry and get too itchy yeah, you know, used to, we used to talk a lot about not bathing them too frequently because you would, you know, destroy the oils in their skin. And to a point, that's still kind of true, but we have a lot better shampoos now than we used to have. A lot of the shampoos aren't drying. So as long as you're using a moisturizing shampoo, then I don't see the problems with, you know, there, I don't really see any problems with people bathing. Now, if you were bathing them, you know, every day or something, you might still, but I, my, my dogs get a bath usually at least once a week. And if they get into something, they may get one twice a week because they, uh, my mini Aussies live in my house and they're not going to come and get on my couch if they've been out rolling in the horse yeah, pasture. So, <laughs> but like I said, you know, just make sure you're using a, a moisturizing shampoo. And I don't see the issues we used to have because a lot of the shampoos used to be really harsh and would strip off a lot of their oils mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you see, if you have one that really needs a bath, but they do tend to have drier skin, there's a lot of leave-on conditioners even that if you need to. And I said, our shampoo is formulated with coat conditioners and all the foam care. So I don't have any, I have never had anybody have any problems with their dogs getting too dry from using it. Yeah, it makes my dog really fluffy. It yeah, I had a guy come the other day and he's like, my dog's hair coat has never been this soft. So Yeah. 
I'm kind of like my hair, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a product question from Capital of the City Canine. Hey guys, um, <laughs> do you guys have, or maybe in the future, anything for fleas and ticks? We don't have anything to kill fleas and ticks, but um, if you have a problem with them. Certainly, the uh, medicated shampoo and then the Vetrosin wound and skin care can help with the problems that are caused by fleas and ticks. So, I said, don't have anything that's going to kill the fleas and ticks, but we can certainly help with the after effects of having a flea or the flea or a tick. Mm -hmm. Making sure that we pretty much, I think we pretty much answered everybody's question who had asked one. Um, and if you have questions after and you're just watching, you can email us at any time and we're pretty quick to respond. So, um, but yeah, thanks, Dr. Mindy, for another great chat. Yeah, it's great to be here and uh, maybe we can do some more of these and find some more topics. So if anybody has some topics they'd really kind of like us mm -hmm. to cover that has to do with, uh, you know, animal wellness, especially skin care stuff, we'd be mm -hmm. glad to, to think about that and... So it's uh, like to get out and educate the public and interact with the people as much as we can. For sure. Um, so everyone, be sure that you like our page um, to get updated on the latest Betterson live events and uh, subscribe to our email because we try to send out emails to remind everybody about what's going on. Um, all of this information from this live will be able to be found on the Betterson blog in about a week. On August 15th at 12 p.m. Eastern, Dr. Mindy and I will be on the Backyard Chickens Facebook page answering all things chicken. We love them. Uh, I will post a link to their page in the comments and be sure to tune in and have a great rest of the week. But yeah. Bye, Thanks everybody. Y'all have a good evening or afternoon, wherever you're at. Oh, yeah. I keep forgetting you're not here. <laughs> here it, it's it's evening time here so it's it's time to <laughs> close up the day <laughs> yep yeah see you guys later bye see ya. bye, -bye.